City Cast from Explicity. Fashion rests upon folly. Art rests upon law. Fashion is ephemeral. Art is eternal. Indeed, what is fashion really? A fashion is merely a form of ugliness, so absolutely unbearable that we have to alter it every six months. It is quite clear that were it beautiful and rational, we would not alter anything that combined those two rare qualities. And wherever dress has been so, it has remained unchanged in law and principle for many hundred years. For centuries now, India has boasted a rich tradition in textiles and drawing from that quite naturally fashion. Increasingly, India is home to a large number of fashion designers and many of them have received international acclaim for their skills and their talent. But if there ever was someone you could credit with being the spokesperson for the industry, working hard to bring the different elements of the fashion and beauty world together, and in short, bringing meaning to fashion in India, that would be my guest today, the famous fashionista Prasad Bidapa. Prasad is not only knowledgeable about fashion, but he is also articulate. He is on the literary city today as a writer. Prasad has been a fashion columnist for Explosity for decades, and he has written widely and variously for other publications as well. He brings to his writing a certain intelligent, gentle wit, and that can only be the result of someone who reads a lot. I know Prasad, at any point in time, he has his nose in three books at once. In his personal life and career, Prasad is known to be very, very liberal, but also of extreme discipline. So, he's the only person that I've met that I can describe as a no-nonsense bohemian. So, let's dive into the literary side of Prasad Bidapa. Prasad, great having you on The Literary City. Thank you for being here. It's an honor, Ramji. I'm so happy to be on your podcast. Thank you, but the honor is all mine. To kick things off, that opening passage that you read was from Oscar Wilde, and you told me that you had a sort of literary explanation for this, cliff notes if you like. So would you care to tell us about it? This is an excerpt that was published in the New York Tribune, April 19th, 1885, and it's taken from The Philosophy of Dress, written by Oscar Wilde. Because after publishing his fashion essay, Wilde became the editor of a fashion magazine. Wilde was known as the fashion activist. Fashion activist? I know someone else who fits that description. <laughs> Why Oscar Wilde? Can we talk a little bit more about him? Great. I love Oscar Wilde because he's just so funny. And I think that one of the reasons that I think that he's so fresh and remains so current is because his take on life and fashion and so many other things was just so, you know, ahead of its time. You know, he predicted things that actually happened. Funny you should bring up that passage, because when you first started writing for us, I went straight to the British Library and I read that, that, that particular passage from The Philosophy of Dress. I read it because of you. Really? <laughs> totally. You were writing a column for me on fashion and I knew nothing about it. So I had to figure it out. Right. You know, this was before the internet. I know, I know. And I had to go to the library <laughs> and, and try to find out a little bit more about what you were saying. This was the British library above Koshi's Cafe to find out more about this mysterious world you were in where only beautiful people were allowed. Getting back, what is it about Oscar Wilde that binds you to him? I think it's many ways the way we are brought up to read. It's I think we had a very British kind of a background, didn't we, our generation? Definitely. And I think that my parents, you know, my dad was in the Air Force and we were always traveling around the country on postings every two years. I was in a new school. But the very first thing that dad would do when we reached a new city was to enroll me in a local library. And I remember in Mysore, when I must have been about seven or eight years old, he enrolled me at the Rotarian Library 
that's just around the corner from where I lived. And it was a very good library. They had just everything in it. But of course, at that age, we were reading Enid Blyton. Enid Blyton, hero of our day, but she's catching a lot of flack now, isn't she? For all they say about her right now, calling her a racist and calling her out for so many things. But I do believe that it was writers like her that formed our use and construction of the English language. Yeah, that's fair to say. And later on, it was British writers like uh, Richmond Crompton, who wrote the William series. You know, I, I found them hysterical. And somehow I found that I really loved the writing of the 1920s, which is really 100 years ago right now. And uh, E.F. Benson were hysterically funny books. You know, that dry British wit and humor. And those are sides that you really could miss very easily. That's what I was brought up on, you know. So I think that formed my sensibility and it formed my sense of humor. And it taught me to be funny in a, in a way. And that influenced you to be funny, did it? You know, it was a, a kind of a, a, a thing that I always had a book in my hand. You, I, I was just one of the world's readers. And then later on, I realized that I was quite witty and quite funny I could be because I would read so much. So it was a way of making friends to make people laugh, you know. And we head right back to Oscar Wilde. Now, Oscar Wilde brought something to the table that was different. I mean, he wrote at a time when everybody else was witty. What was his secret sauce? I think it was also a sense of being able to put his finger on the, the pervading sense of the time. He was able to isolate a certain thing, like, like what he said about fashion being something that was so fleeting. And I mean, so many things, I mean, you read his plays especially, you see that he uses humor as a, a tool for in a way, social awareness. He tells you about the morals and the mores of the time. You know, he uh, talks about class distinctions when rich women fall in love with poor men. He talks about, you know, the importance of being earnest where, you know, the plot line of that is it's, it's also a very, very funny play. He always had something witty to say. You told me something very funny about his last words. While he was on his deathbed, he actually died in a cheap hotel, I was told. And he looked up and he opened his eyes and he said, either that wallpaper goes or I go and died. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure if the story is entirely true. Well, it goes to form, doesn't it? So do you think that Oscar Wilde used humor as a, a weapon of defense? It could be, but I mean, I'm... We all defensive at the end of the day. We wear defensive colors. We have defensive mannerisms. You know, you defend yourself against society to a great extent as you grow up in the world. It's not exactly like society is there to uplift you and celebrate you just because you think they should. You have to fight for it in the end, do we not? And I think that's, that's sort of the human condition in many ways that you look and like we were talking earlier when we were chatting about a Bernie Sanders having a very young fan base. So maybe that's part of it. It takes, it takes a long time to be celebrated. It takes a long time to be appreciated. And it takes an even longer time to be loved, I think. Each generation to its own, wouldn't you agree? I, I must say that all my life I've been very inspired by young people. I'm very, very sort of into youth culture and learning from the young. And from both my children, I learned a lot because, you know, it's sort of you have to open your minds to new ideas. And when you have children growing up like that, I think it forces you into accepting a different culture, you know, the culture of youth. Like my children hardly read at all. They are visual people. So you didn't enroll them in the Rotarian library now, did you? No, I did not. And I, I'm in the house. Judy and I are both such avid readers. I have a stack of books by my bedside. We are constantly reading. We just read a lot. So you keep thinking that through some kind of osmosis, the children will get it. But both the children grew up to be very visually oriented, much more interested in the internet, easy for them to get information very quickly, you know? And I find most young people are like that. 
there are very few people I know who read, very, very few young people. You know, today it's the internet. Growing up, it was a calculator. If you dare use one, instead of doing mental math, you were looked down upon. You know, mental acuity and knowledge were the middle class virtues. You know, that middle class mentality of educating your children and ensuring that they had a good foundation and pushing them to study and pushing them to tuitions and pushing them from school to college and from college to specialization. It really paid off big time, didn't it? So does that reflect your own style of parenting? Not really. I mean, I, I took the easy way out and sent my children to so-called progressive schools, which I think at the end of the day were not very progressive. Then I tried to sort of instill a set of values in the children, which I think that we inherited from our parents. And I, that I think we were most successful in, because those kind of things happen more by osmosis, really, than by any direct kind of intervention. I mean, the, the children see you reacting with people, your own friends, your own family, and they learn lessons from that in terms of human relationships and how to maintain friendships or whatever, you know. But I think in terms of a rigorous uh, schooling, I think I failed completely. I was not able to inspire them to study very hard or study very much, you know. Okay, but did anyone suffer for it? I'm not sure because, you know, Aviva, my daughter, is very smart. She's become a swimsuit designer. She writes very well. I'm surprised at how well she writes. And I think for someone who's never read, and then she says, Dad, you think I didn't read because you didn't see me reading a book. But I read a lot on the internet. I read a lot. So there you go. Who are we to criticize? Adam, my son, runs a successful homestay. He converted our coffee estate in Kurg. They found the lives they want to lead. That sounds nice. Where is this place? Let's give Adam a plug. It's called the Kolomote Estates and it's in Polibeta, which is a very beautiful village in Kurg. Spell it. K-O-L-A. M-O-T-T-E, Colamote. And he runs a very friendly, very fun place. He's very good with children. He's good with large family groups who come in. So to all our listeners, go to Adam Bithapal's place. <laughs> take a whole complement of books with you and spend the weekend reading. <laughs> yeah, that would be lovely. There's a link to Adam's uh, homestay in the podcast description. Prasad, on a weekend such as this, what would be your choice of books? Yeah, I tend to read a lot of authors I don't know even because I've sort of found something interesting about it. And I belong to a set of friends who are all good readers. My good friend David Abraham, who's the designer, lives in Delhi and we exchange books often and we're constantly finding something to send to each other. So I have a click, a small click of people who I tend to exchange books with and take suggestions from. Otherwise, I also read things like the Booker Prize winner or something like that. I must say that last year's Booker, uh, Shuggy Bain. R right. Who wrote it now? Uh, Douglas Stewart. Pretty powerful prose. I really loved that book. I thought it was wonderful. And I only read it because it was the Booker Prize winner. But when I got into it, I really liked it very much. I thought it was... And, and I go through a phase, you know, like sometimes I just want to read Japanese literature like I read uh, uh, Bre Breasts and Eggs. Did you read that new Japanese novel? No, I confess I haven't read Breasts and Eggs by Kawakami, right? But I did read some excellent reviews about it. Oh, it's quite wonderful. But Japanese literature fascinates me because, I mean, the country fascinates me. It, it's interesting to read a book in the country that it was written in. You know, somehow it becomes in a way more vivid, you know. Then at one point, uh, I started getting a lot into Afghani translations. I find the Afghan situation extremely tragic. And I found it quite fascinating to read a couple of books. I mean, there was one called The, the Wasted Vigil by Nadim Aslam. So while your reading interest is eclectic, there cannot be a conversation with you on literature without bringing fashion into it. Yeah. <laughs> And we have discussed the dichotomy within that of writers who think that they are above fashion. But you had a riposte for that. Uh, that wonderful line from The Devil Wears Prada. Yes, exactly. That's the one. There's an article by this lady called Rose Lagasse. 
you know, who writes about this. Can I read that? Yes, please. That would be great. So says Rose, I've always loved the film The Devil Wears Prada, starring Meryl Streep as an Anna Wintour type with Anne Hathaway as her fledgling temporary assistant. The Devil Wears Prada cerulean monologue stands alone in my mind as the best part of the film. It brings meaning to the world of curation, to the average Joe who thinks none of this affects them. Something to be said for curation, for sure. Now, why don't you give us the whole nine yards, the whole quote? So this is the monologue that happens. To set it up very quickly, Meryl Streep plays Miranda Priestley, the Anna Wintour type person, and Anne Hathaway plays Andy Sachs, the temp who gets lectured for daring to say the two belts look the same. And here's Prasad Bidapa reading the monologue. So you go to your closet and you select, out of it, I don't know, that lumpy blue sweater, for instance, because you're trying to tell the world that you take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back. But what you don't know is that this sweater is not just blue. It's not turquoise. It's not lapis. It's actually cerulean. You're also blithely unaware of the fact that in 2002, Oscar de la Renta did a collection of cerulean gowns. And then I think it was Yves Saint Laurent, wasn't it, who showed cerulean military jackets. And then cerulean quickly showed up in the collections of eight different designers. Then it filtered down through the department stores and then trickled on down into some tragic casual corner where you, no doubt, fished it out of some clearance bin. However, that blue represents millions of dollars and countless jobs. And so it's sort of comical how you think that you've made a choice that exempts you from the fashion industry when in fact you're wearing the sweater that was selected for you by the people in this room from a pile of stuff. Not only was that monologue very well written, great scripting, but considering that you delivered those lines, it was so credible. It got pretty real. And it seemed like you really felt the import of that ticking off. I think that's just the most fantastic put down. Yes, that was great writing indeed. And speaking of great writing, let's move on to great writers. So if you were sitting around in your son Adam's homestay and you could invite any literary figure for dinner, who would it be? I, I, could I have a table for six? Because <laughs> that would be nice. It's your son's homestay. <laughs> you can invite as many people as you want. <laughs> well, Oscar Wilde, I think, would be definitely... Uh, uh, you know, like maybe I'd make up a table of all my favorite writers from the 20s, you know. Okay, who be these people? So, so let's let, look at Richmond Crompton. Um, there's Oscar Wilde. There's E.F. Benson, three of my absolute favorites. Hang on, hang on. Not so fast. All this has any meaning only when you tell me about table seating. We must have table seating. So who is sitting to the right and left of you and who's sitting in front? I'd keep Richmond Crompton on my right and uh, E.F. Benson on my left and Oscar Wilde opposite me. I think the four of us would have a blast completely because all three of them are so funny and I'm someone who really appreciates good humor. So I would make them very happy by laughing at all the jokes, I'm sure. And you know that Richmond Crompton had this dry wit, you know, which was, you know, for some, a woman writing in the 20s, it was, I think, I, I don't know where it came from. And I must say that watching television serials like Downton Abbey did bring that all back to me. Well, they were masterful, weren't they? They could bend language to their will. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you write a lot these days? Well, I do, but mostly on fashion. I do write quite a lot, but it's mostly for um, articles on Khadi or the revival of the beautiful handlooms of India. And I think it my bound duty to make you write a little more, to spread your wings. So I have a suggestion. How about you write a supermarket thriller, paperback murder mystery <laughs> with dry wit and where the sexy murderess is wearing khadi. That'll, that's a good idea. And a cerulean jacket. <laughs> I'll do that, Rabji, for sure. <laughs> Prasad Bidapa. 
It was a privilege having you here on The Literary City. See you back soon. And it's time for that fun segment, What's That Word?, where we delve into the etymology of words and phrases that we use normally every day, but never stop to think about where they came from. And to help me with it is my co-host today, she of the inquisitive mind and reticent word. I will let her introduce herself. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is Praniti, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. P with an A, that's intriguing. P with another E is somewhat fluid. <laughs> so, P with an A, what's new? What's new is that fun game, Wordle. Have you been playing Wordle? Every day, love it. It's such fun. It is, it is completely. For those of our listeners who haven't yet stumbled onto Wordle, why don't you tell them a little about it? Yeah, so it's pretty simple. Um, every day, a five-letter word is chosen. That players try to guess within six tries. Now, with each guess, you will know if the letter mm -hmm. is in the word and if it is in the right position or the wrong position in the word. And you basically guess by trial and error and, of course, inference. Great explanation. We used to play a game on pen and paper like that, right? Bulls and cows, remember? Yeah, I remember bulls and cows. We will put a link to where uh, one place where you can play Wordle in the description of this podcast. This game has just taken the internet by storm, hasn't it? it really I mean, it's. Does. I heard that. I heard that on the first of November last year, when the guy first invented it, there were ninety players, and two months later, three hundred thousand, and it's just been growing since then. Wow! So, who invented it? Well, actually, it, the Wordle was invented by a guy called Wardle, Josh Wardle. <laughs> That's funny. But here's something that will bring a tear to the eye of the romantics. Did you know that the invention of Wordle is actually a love story? Tell me more. Josh Wardle invented this game for his partner, who just loved word games, you know, like the New York Times spelling bee. So this Brooklyn resident wrote this game during the pandemic when there was nothing else going on. There's an inset story that he was supposed to get her a gift and didn't or couldn't. And so he just wrote this entire game for his partner and just did it for the fun of it. Can you imagine? Yeah, that's amazing. Here's something that will bring a tear to the Indian eye because his partner, her name is Palak Shah. Oh, wow. That really is something. Palak Shah. Or is it Palak Shah? Whatever. Clearly, she is spinach to his muscle. <laughs> Wordle, a love monument from a man to his woman. Sort of like the Taj Mahal of words. <laughs> the Taj Mahal of word games. <laughs> yes, you got it. That's right. A monument of love from a man to his woman. <laughs> cool. Okay, P with an A. On to what's that word. So, what's the word? The phrase you used in your interview with Prasad Pidapa was the whole nine yards. I'm curious about the etymology of that phrase. It's a phrase we use so commonly, I mean, to basically say the whole shebang, everything in the kitchen sink right. and all that. You want me to give you the whole nine yards about the whole nine yards? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'll start with the conclusion. Okay. There's no conclusion. Oh, no. They've not been able to find the origin of this particular phrase. Many theories abound but no conclusion. The phrase has been described as the holy grail of etymology. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. The knights of the written word in their quest to find its meaning have all failed. Now, apparently, lots of research has gone into it, but nothing has come through as yet. I'll go with what I've found so far. The first use of this phrase dates back to the year 1907. Okay. And in 1907, there was a newspaper that reported something about a, a baseball game. It was the Mitchell commercial. They wrote about a baseball game. In that, they made a reference and they used the phrase, but we cannot promise the full nine yards. That was the first time that they found any written appearance of that phrase, but no etymology to it. One mini conclusion they have reached is that it was a phrase in popular use around the Indiana area 
And one of the writers just wrote it in a paper. And because it was a local paper, the editors didn't feel the need to explain that phrase. But it leaves the question wide open. They have not been able to find the etymology of that phrase at all. At best, all the theories that abound as to where that phrase came from just comes down to someone told me. Well, speaking of someone told me, someone told me uh-huh. that the phrase the whole nine yards comes from the Indian nine yards sari. Ah, that's not surprising. I mean, you know, we Indians love to claim everything for our own, but the theory is as likely as it is not likely. You know, it might be plausible, but there's no proof. The nine yard sari, which means the length of the nine yard sari itself refers to something before it. And the plausible explanation for that is a bolt of cloth. A bolt is nine yards long. So you know how Indian women normally wear saris that are five yards or six yards long. And only during ceremonial conditions, they go the whole nine yards and wear a nine yard sari. You know that you've seen the nine yard sari, right? Especially in South India, they have a very complicated way of wearing it. There's a little flap that comes down the front and they goes through their legs and then they pull it up from the back and gives them a great deal of mobility and they they look like athletes. You know, I, I have aunts that wear a nine yard sari during ceremonial functions and they look like athletes, you know, the whole nine yards thing. And you, you might call them Usain Bolt. <laughs> Similarly, people in Rajasthan, the turban that men wear, the ceremonial turban that men wear is nine yards long. And in England, they said that to make a proper three-piece suit for a gentleman, a tailor will use the whole nine yards. But that has been debunked because Savile Row tailors told etymologists they have no idea where it came from. So once again, lots of plausible explanations very little proof. Ah, I get it. You were making a fashion reference. A what? A fashion reference? Oh, you mean because I was? I said that in my conversation with Prasad Bidapa. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. Because I was talking to a fashion expert, I may have used that phrase subliminally, but I wasn't thinking about it. Well, anyway, the most popular usage of that phrase, according to people who measure these things, is World War II gunnery. Now, apparently, the length of a machine gun ammunition belt is 27 feet long. Now, a yard is three feet, so 27 feet is nine yards. If the gunners used a whole belt full of ammo and shot at someone, they said, we gave them the whole nine yards. Right. Going on from there, there are many, many theories that are bound, but it's, it's as I said, very little proof. Yeah, but speaking of pop references, the most famous reference is the movie, The Whole Nine Yards. Oh, yeah. So could it have something to do with American football? Well, I checked on that too. I called a friend who knows all about American football, and he said to me that they don't have a measure of nine yards in American football. They have a measure of 10 yards, but not nine yards. And someone wrote in to say that, yeah, that's exactly what it means, because if someone fumbled the ball in the first yard out of the measure of 10 yards, then he would have to carry the ball the whole nine yards. What? To me, that sounds, <laughs> makes no sense. Yeah, that sounds ridiculous <laughs> because he could have fumbled the ball anywhere in the 10 yards, right? <laughs> That's absurd. Now, what if he fumbled the ball in the ninth yard? Does that mean they're going to say that he, ca- he has to carry the ball a whole yard? <laughs> I, I don't get it. Wasn't that movie about prison yards? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the phrase, and it just boils down to someone told me. Well, again, speaking of someone told me, a Scotsman once told me that it's also the length required to make a Scottish kilt. Oh, he told you, did he? Did he also tell you about the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> well, anyway, let's leave it at that. It's a delicious mystery as to where that phrase came from. But that's the whole nine yards. There is one last reference that you might like. You know, you've often told me how you love sailing. Mm-hmm. So apparently, you know, sails and masts, yeah. when they unfurl all their sails, they say it's nine yards worth of sail that they use. 
So they gave it a whole nine yards. Oh, I like that. So the next time you go sailing and you have to run up a full nine yards on the mast, I'd recommend that you take an auntie with you dressed in a ceremonial sari. Rip that sari off or run it up the mast and you will have the wind in your sails. <laughs> and a naked aunt. <laughs> okay, P with an A, that was fun. Let's do this again next week. Bye. Bye. If you have a word or a phrase and you are curious or confused about its etymology, usage, correctness, send us a message. And we would love to have you on the show and discuss it live with you on the air. The Literary City at Explosity.com or simply TLC at Explosity.com. The Facebook group Bangalore Literary Society or Instagram Explosity BLR. You can send us a message, slide into our DMs, whatever you like. And if your question is selected, we'll call you. Let's spare a thought for the many children who would love to have the same opportunity to be educated and become thriving, contributing members of society. Many of them simply don't get an education. But the good thing is there are many organizations who strive to bring them the education they deserve. And one of them is the Association for the Physically Disabled, or APD. It's located in Bangalore. And they do wonderful work. For years, they've run a school bringing education to little children. And as always, they could do with some help. So we ask that you find it in your heart to head to apd-india.org or apd-india.org and make a donation, whatever you like. All the information is there on their website. And as Explosity, we have supported them for many, many years and we know the wonderful work that they do. To find out what we do, join the Facebook group, Bangalore Literary Society. Doesn't matter if you're not from Bangalore, just join the group. It's going to be fun. Okay, that's our show. I'm Ramji Chandran. Thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.